the cloud. Okay, so that way I can post this later. So um, this session is slightly different. Oh, let me see what was the question here. Uh, where is that? Chat. Check show up. There we go. Oh, there it is. Okay, good. People can hear me. I'm going to set that up in the corner so I can keep an eye on it. Okay. So uh, this session is a little bit different um, than the one that I had originally planned. Um, I originally wanted to, uh, was originally going to talk about non-MARC metadata um, and working with MARC edit. I'll probably do that next time. Uh, this time though, uh, since we have a lot of folks who are starting to work remotely and have maybe never worked with MARC edit or worked with a very little, um, there was some folks that had asked if I could do something a little bit more um, straightforward in terms of how do you work with MARC records inside the MARC editor. So this one's going to be a little bit more of a demonstration um, as we kind of go through stuff. Um, I am inviting folks to ask questions, um, as many as you want. Um, we'll, the, I'll talk for about an hour-ish and then um, I've set this up to, to go for another half hour, 40 minutes. So if we have questions, that way people can have them. But feel free to interrupt me. I'll try and keep an eye on it. Um, and then uh, when I'm done, I'll post this to YouTube and we'll also um, provide a link to these particular slides because these slides will be more just a reference for me to go back and forth from because generally I'm going to probably work uh, within Marketa. And before I get going, let me close Skype so that nobody tries to talk to me. All right, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. So as I said, um, my favorite Simpsons episode uh, where Homer says that he gets fired and says that he's, it's his first day. So this is what ends up ended up happening was um, I had did this last session um, and folks had asked me um, uh, if I could do some work um, on talking about Mark Edit specifically. And, and specifically folks were asking me what can they use Mark Edit for. So um, a lot of people tend to use Mark Edit for very, very specific things. Um, they've set it up. Uh, maybe they have some very specific tasks and that's all they use it for. And so a few things just for folks to be able to kind of get an idea of what some of the things you can use Mark Edit for. So you can automate large vendor Mark Records projects, um, which is probably something that many of you are doing. It's something that um, um, we uh, uh, get, I've been asked to help people do um, over this uh, period where um, folks are getting access to more e-resources, so ways to um, modify records that they have locally. Uh, facilitate large data cleanups. Again, we have a lot of free time and there's a lot of projects that probably never were going to get done that now we have an opportunity to spend some time doing. Uh, Mark Edit can help facilitate the conversion from AACR2 to hybrid RDA records as well as um, clean up the ISBD punctuation in the process. Uh, the tool's been designed, um, this is probably what I use it personally more for, to convert data from non-MARC formats to MARC and from MARC to other non-MARC formats. Um, the tool has uh, capacity to um, reconcile MARC data using linked data concepts, which also has pieces built on top of it for validation of headings, as well as creation of LC subjects on the fly. And I'm actually going to show you how that works. I think it's kind of cool as part of this process. Um, you can validate records, so being able to um, validate structure as well as use of the data inside, uh, splitting, joining large data, data sets, managing character encodings, which I will talk about because it's important, especially for new folks who are using Mark Edit to understand how Unicode data um, is used within Mark Edit and how it gets passed back into your ILS systems, because uh, there are um, a number of um, uh, implications of that. Integration with OCLC and other ILS systems. In fact, for folks who are using Alma um, and other systems where traditionally maybe you need to have a VPN or um, be on your local network, a lot of times Alma's um, APIs are a lot more open. Um, and so uh, the integration there um, works slightly different than if you were sitting on campus. Uh, merging between two data sets and also the ability to retrieve data remotely, either from OEI, Z39.50, SRU, Atom Pub, so a variety of different formats of Mark Edit supports to be able to collect data and pull it into um, your record set for um, editing and then loading into catalogs or wherever you're going to push the data. All right, so I was asked a number of times this week, I've been given records, now what do I do? 
And so I thought that probably a good place to start would probably be for folks who maybe have never had to install Mark Edit or have had to, um, or using it for the first time. What do I do now that I've downloaded a set of records? Um, and I'm going to show it to you, but essentially in Mark Edit, um, the workflow process looks um, a little bit something like this if you're editing it. So you can validate records looking for initial errors. Um, you don't have to do that specifically. Mark Edit will do that on the fly. Um, you can create your own validation fields. So for example, if you're doing um, uh, e-records from vendors, um, uh, I've helped people a number of times create custom um, uh, rules files so that they're checking for very specific data. Um, you break the data into mnemonic. Once the, rate, the data, the mark records are broken, you open them in the mark editor. We're gonna do a lot of that today. You perform your global edits or automate your changes and we're gonna walk through what those look like. You save your changes, you compile the records back into your ILS, and those are what goes to your ILS system like COA, ALMA, Evergreen, or OCLC. So let me show you what that looks like. Just the very straightforward, um, if you've never worked with Mark Edit before. So I threw um, a quick record set into my desktop here. Uh, sanity webinars one or two. All right. Uh, so let's say um, I was to have received um, a record set. And actually, I'm going to grab a set that starts here as an MRK. So the MRK records in Mark Edit would be the same thing that maybe you download from OCLC as a .dat file, um, or that you get from um, uh, Innovative as a .dot uh, out file. Uh, or from a vendor as a .mark file. Um, .mrk is Mark Edit's extension um, for binary mark records. Uh, the tool um, really doesn't care about extensions. It'll open any file um, as long as the data is in mark or in the mnemonic format. It's just the extensions tell Mark Edit how to open the files directly into the application. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, run the steps through from the interface. That way you actually see what you um, do. So um, I would need to break the records. Um, some people open records directly into the editor. I like to have it as a multiple step process. That way I have a .mrk, a .mrk file, so the, the human readable version. So I would take my file, uh, put it in my box, and execute it. That generates um, a record set. There are 555 records. This is the file that got created. Um, that binary file can now be edited in the editor. So now I'm inside the editor. I can read these records. They look a little bit like the connection interface, just in a more notepad-like way. I can edit these records, make changes to them. We're going to um, talk about what these global edit functions do. But let's say I wanted to add a field really quickly. Add my field across all the record sets. And now when I'm done, um, I want to be able to take these records and send them back to my ILS system. Um, I would hit this little compilation button and I would resave the data. Saved edits. The program down here says it processed 555 records. Um, I have I'm not going to save those changes. I have the file here right now. This is the one that I can now upload to my ILS. So that's essentially the very basic steps that you go through from I've been given a set of records. Um, I need to break that set of records. Uh, I need to edit that set of records. And then I need to save that set of records so that I can reuse them back into my ILS. So a couple of really simple steps to go through in order to get data into um, your system. Before I go on, um, let's say you get a set of records from a vendor um, and Mark Edit can't process them. And sometimes that'll happen. Um, I'm going to break one of these records really quick. Mark records are super easy to break. I'm going to open this up and I'm going to do this. So I just changed the number of bytes that this record um, says that it represents. Um, so it's, it's now an invalid record. Um, when I process it in Mark Edit, you'll notice down here that the tool will turn um, the processing element into red. And this is part of the reason I like to have a two-step process because Mark Edit will validate your records automatically as it processes the data. And from here, I can see what the, the error is. In this case, the error is this one record. 
Um, it tells me that the record length is different from the reported record length. Um, and so I can know what's going on with the record set. Uh, if I wanted to take this a step further, I could use the mark validator and I could validate the record structure to see if there are any other invalid records. I could remove invalid records that are preventing mark edit from um, processing the data set. Um, or I could check the records against the rules file. In the case of the red box here, um, I would be using the structure validation because that allows me to um, identify the records that are going to be problematic to load into your ILS because they will be structurally invalid mark records and actually remove them and put them into another place so I can edit them later um, and then be able to edit the records that are good, separate the records that are bad, and be able to work with those. All right, so that's a good place to start. Let's go back here. All right, so if you're still getting started, so what are some things that you could use to kind of learn a little bit about Mark Edit in addition to what I'm assuming are going to be these weekly sessions probably for the next four or five weeks. Um, Mark Edit has a 101 webinar series. So this is a series uh, that I created uh, about a year or two ago. Um, it goes through four steps um, uh, from I have Mark Data to I'm working with non-Mark Data to I want to automate to some other uh, stuff. Um, it gives you kind of a very high level um, look at the different parts of the application. I think they're about an hour, hour and a half each. Um, and they're um, kind of a good way to get started. There are knowledge base articles, tutorials, lots of stuff in YouTube. Um, and then I'm going to be working on the sample lesson plan since I have a lot of free time on my hands now. Um, if you need to get help, um, please feel free to sign up and use the listserv. George Mason University hosts it, which is great. They do that for the user community. I'm on the, the, the uh, listserv. I answer questions as I get them. You can contact me directly, which is what a lot of people are doing right now. I do prefer the listserv because they get, um, they get archived, um, but you're free to send questions to me directly. And then within Mark Edit, um, if you want to see if the program has a built-in help file for something, you can ask it how to do something. Um, and the program will give you back suggestions inside this kind of um, uh, uh, built-in help file kind of function. It's a natural language process. So just enter in a question and the program will see what it can find. Um, and if it can't find something, it may direct you to YouTube or the listserv or something else. All right, so that's great. So now we're that's kind of the, the getting kind of started. So let's go ahead and move into talking about the Mark Editor. So especially for folks who are starting new, I wanted to basically step back into if you're starting using the Mark Editor, what are the two things that you really need to get right before you start working with Mark Edit um, to ensure that the records that you're working with um, are saved in a way that um, are going to be useful for your ILS as well as being able to set the system up so that it works um, uh, in a way that's going to display Unicode characters correctly as well as um, handle really large data files, log your data, um, set up auto saving, all that good stuff. Uh, so let's go ahead and just look at what the options are. So the options are set with the little uh, options button here down in the corner. Um, Mark Edit has a section specifically for the Mark Editor up here. So Mark Edit has a couple of options specifically. Um, the ones that are probably most important as you set up the application have to do with the fonts. So right here is the font that will be used to display records um, when you're looking to edit them. Um, by default, Mark Edit's going to look for a Unicode font. Um, it wants to use either um, Arial Unicode, or if you don't have that, a lot of us who are moving to Windows 10 don't have that unless you've paid for a separate license or have migrated your system from Windows 7 or an older version office. Um, and so what I tend to use personally is I use the No Two Sans fonts. These are fonts that Google provides. They're roughly about 1.2 gigabytes. They cover um, um, almost twice as many characters as the Arial Unicode font. Um, and they work pretty well with inside of uh, inside of Mark Edit. So that's what I tend to um, look for. 
If you don't have a Unicode font when you install MarkEdit, it will actually try and prompt you to go and get the Noto font. Um, if you um, install MarkEdit not as an administrator, it will install the fonts to be used just within MarkEdit. Um, so that way you don't have to be an administrator to do the font installation. So this is where you set your fonts. Um, for most of us, I think on this call, we're all going to probably be using either Mark 8 or Unicode. So keep the default encoding to UTF-8. Um, if you are um, doing records and you're in an environment where you're not working with Unicode or Mark 8, but say a um, regional encoding, um, Mark Edit can be configured um, to use any of these characters uh, pa code pages. Um, and so these are non-Unicode code pages um, that can be used within the application. And what that does is that reconfigures the editor so that it understands what type of character sets are being sent to it so that it can display your data appropriately. There are shortcuts here. Um, if you know that you always need UTF-8 data, you can tell Mark Edit, you know, just go ahead and always, every time you compile records within the Mark Editor, always turn them to UTF-8. And what Mark Edit will do is it will assume that the data in your editor is either in UTF-8 or Mark 8, and it'll facilitate the converts, the conversions between them. Um, likewise, if you're on a legacy system and you need all of your data BD in Mark 8, you can tell Mark Edit, you know what, after I'm done doing my work, always compile the data to Mark 8. Um, so I don't have to do that as a separate step. And so that way you can actually work with data in Unicode and then convert it back to Mark 8 just as part of your saving process. Um, since I work in a variety of environments, I leave both of those unchecked and I tell it what I want to convert data to. Um, these ones you can ignore. Um, the next ones that are most important is um, I always, I think that this is turned on by default. Um, suggest preview mode for large files. When you get files that are over 200 megabytes, MarkEdit will suggest opening them in the preview mode, which allows MarkEdit to open the records faster. Um, I always say use the enable autosave. Autosave allows MarkEdit to essentially capture your changes every five minutes. So if you haven't saved um, a change in those five minutes, it will save it for you and put it in a location that it can then pull the record data back um, if the program was to crash. Um, and then finally, um, enable uh, logging. So this is uh, allows you to um, this allows MarkEdit to track all of the changes that you've made. There are some really good reasons why logging should be enabled. Um, I will show you um, one of those, two of those actually, as we go through the uh, examples. The last thing that I think that you um, should consider uh, and think about in terms of setting up MarkEdit for the first time, it's in the Mark Engine. Um, and it has to do with Unicode normalization. So there are a couple of options here that have a direct impact in how data gets interacted with and edited within the Mark Editor. So by default, Mark Edit uses what's called the NFKD notation. This is a notation that the Library of Congress recommends and uses within their own system. It's the notation that's in the Mark 21 specification that's been put created to allow for round trip ability between Unicode and Mark 8. And essentially what it does, is it takes a character with a diacritic and it keeps those as two separate bytes. So if I have an E with an accent mark in Mark 8, that E with an accent mark is represented as two characters, the diacritic and the character. In Unicode, in the KD notation, the order of those values are flipped, but still the values represented by a diacritic and a character, and your system combines those together on the screen to be seen as one character. For the Library of Congress and for systems that require you to use um, the notation that LC recommends within the specification, you would need to use the KD notation. And there are some ILS systems that actually are, when they were configured, um, and unless you've changed this, when they're configured, they require this KD notation. And if you give it a diacritic that doesn't use the KD notation, the diacritic won't display correctly. It'll display um, all wonky-like. Um, I find Voyager tends to be one of those systems. Um, I, it must be that you have to make a decision when you've installed the software the first time as to, a as to normalization, but it actually does make a difference. This was actually how we found that this was a problem. Um, 
The other notation is what's called the canonical notation, the canonical Unicode form. Um, that allows you to take a character with a diacritic, and instead of representing those as two characters, it represents them as the single code point. It is my preferred method, especially if I'm working with data that's not going to be in MARC. Uh, because working with data in, say, XML or a non mark metadata format, it's a lot easier to work with the data in the canonical format. Um, but this will allow you to um, tweak mark edit so that internally, as you're doing global edits or as you're editing any data, mark edit will read the data that you've configured here. And if you've told it to enforce normalization, will enforce all interactions so that data gets normalized and normalized. Um, uniformly. And the uniform normalization is actually also really important. When OCLC changed WorldCat to allow any valid Unicode data to go into it, they made a decision that they wouldn't do normalization except for um, search and indexing. That means that if I download a record from OCLC and that record came from the Library of Congress, very likely all of the data that's diacritics are going to be in the KD notation. But if I type a diacritic, uh, character into connection and save it. That character, because Windows will give you, because the way Windows and, and uh, works, it will type the character as a canonical um, diacritic. So when it's saved, now you'll have mixed diacritics. You'll have uh, in, in mixed normalizations, you will have a record that has both the KD and the NFC notation. And depending on your ILS, that can cause significant problems. And so what MarkEdit does is it normalizes that data together so that they're uniform. Um, and this option is selected by default, exclude 880 fields. 880 fields in Mark 21 are just crazy stupid um, in terms of how the normalization rules work. Um, this tells MarkEdit to treat them that way so that the normalization rules that apply everywhere else don't apply to the 880. All right, so that gets us started. Uh, lots of getting us started. Okay. All right, so the normalization fragmentation. All right, so what I want to do is I want to go through some of the uh, the the um, the tools in Mark Edit, and I want to walk you through kind of how they work um, and what they do, and kind of um, if there's questions as we go through, please um, let me know. What that means is I'm also not going to be in the slides very often um, because I think it's just easier to to do this in the application itself. All right, so let's go ahead and open up the editor. I'm going to go ahead and grab a file. Uh, I'm going to get uh, this subset here. It's a small record set. Okay, so I have a small file. All right, so a couple things I want to point out, especially for those of you who are new, in terms of how Mark edits Mark editor is laid out. So. The edit functions here um, tend to be things like find, replace, copy, cut, special undo, regular undo. Um, you'll find uh, a couple of things related to um, character encodings down towards the bottom. So these are things like converting character content, international keyboard shortcuts, um, ALA and Unicode character mappings, virtual keyboards, so that way you can do uh, transliteration. All of that lives in the edit space. Um, in addition to this thing called edit shortcuts, which I'm going to show you here um, some of them in a minute, edit shortcuts are special um, kind of functions that tend to be either really complicated regular expressions that I get asked for a lot, or they do very specific things that tend to be um, related more towards Mark 21. Since I try very hard to keep Mark edit to be more Mark agnostic, and this is partly due to the fact that probably a third of the users that use Mark Edit don't use Mark 21. Um, I try and keep most of the work that the application does um, not tied to any particular character, uh, any particular metadata um, uh, rules or, or um, uh, any rule, any particular rules. So when I do do things that tend to be more um, closely related to a particular rule set, they go into these edit shortcuts area. Um, I have reports. So reports allow you to find out things about the records. So field counts, material types. This is also where you'll find things like headings validation. So this is built on top of Mark Edit's linked data tool. So you can validate headings from LCSH, um, as well as how to manage the log files. And I'm going to talk about why this is important. Most people will never look at them, but there are some good reasons for why you might want to look at the log files. 
tools. This is where you're going to find all the global editing functions. The stuff on top here tends to be tools that work on an entire file. And they also tend to be tools that in a lot of cases you can put into um, tasks. Um, down below here, these are the global editing tools. These are tools that run directly within um, the Mark Editor. And they're tools that allow you to do things like um, adding fields, uh, editing subfields, uh, swapping field data, indicator data, or sorting uh, data uh, records inside the record or the entire file based on a particular sort. Um, and then these things over here, um, if you have them, uh, they would be turned on if you've turned on ILS integration or OCLC integration or have installed any plugins. Uh, this one's really more for me. It's an automation option that I've added uh, specifically so that I can run PowerShell scripts within the application. So that's kind of where how things get set up. So I'm going to answer a couple questions that I've gotten this week um, as I go through demonstrating some of the tools. So the first thing that uh, has come up quite a bit um, as people have started working with MarkEdit is asking, how do I do things um, when I, uh, on a subset of records? So I have a set of records um, and I need to say add fields to records that are missing a specific set of criteria. Um, so there are two ways really to go about doing this. The most straightforward and probably easiest for most folks would be to use this tool called Select Edit Records for Edit. This tool allows you to pick the field that you want to be doing the evaluation on. So let's say in this case I wanted to evaluate um, the 041 and I'm going to look for data that's uh, French. So in this case let's say um, I do the 041 and I'm going to look at subfield H and I go ahead and I import the file. And for any records that don't have an 041 subfield H, you'll see this thing that says display field not found. If it does have it, you'll see it in the display field. And now I could search for things. I can do a couple different things. So let's say I wanted to capture all the records that didn't have an 041 subfield H because I, I, I need to have one uh, for whatever reason. I can go ahead and click this button that says does not match. And the tool will select all of the records that don't have a subfield H in the, this particular display field. Let's say I wanted to take all the records that did have that field, then I could click invert selections and the tool will flip it and it'll take the records that do have it uh, based on the inversion. Let's say I wanted to do a specific search though. So I can search um, like this, which is gonna do an in-string search so there are five records inside my record that has an 041 subfield H. Um, I can do a regular expression. I can do a search for a particular match case. I can search for an exact word. I could do multiple searches so I could retain the checked items and I could search again and say maybe I want to find records that are, I'm not sure that I'll actually find anything, but maybe German. Um, so I can then stack searches together. Um, or I can search all record data. If I check search all record data, it's not searching the data in the display field. It's actually searching the entire record and then finding information. So I'm going to take these records that were French. So these are the ones that are marked. So I'm going to go ahead and set export selected. Those records have been exported. And now you'll see that inside the mark editor, it's changed. It just shows those five records that I've extracted. So now editing these records becomes a lot simpler because I don't have to worry about all of the other data. And so now I can do things like say, add that field that I wanted to add um, for this particular record set, add French. Um, or I could go ahead and uh, delete a field. And then when I'm done, I can click the save button and mark edit saves all that data back into the original source file. So if I go back and I open um, that file I was just working with and here's my, my French record, we can see that the, the data set that I added has been added and the nine whatever 96 has been deleted. So what I ended up being able to do here was I was able to work with a very small subset of data um, and do it in a way that allowed me to narrow the scope um, without having to do things like really complicated regular expressions or conditional searching or what have you. 
Um, so that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is using um, conditional queries. So in mark edits replace function, the replace function is probably one of the coolest functions. It, it allows you access to all of the data. Um, you can do conditional searches before you actually do this part of the, the process. So um, let's say I wanted to do that same kind of a search where I wanted to limit my record edits to data, to records that had French in the 041. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and use a regular expression equals 041 dot star slash H. Um, and I'm going to say French. All right, so I'm going to tell it that if it finds um, FRE inside subfield H, then I want to do that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the 049 just because I can see it in my first record here, 049. Uh, we're going to find uh, uh, in the and I'm going to use another regular expression. I use a lot of regular expressions. Um, I'm looking for um, subfield A and C E O A. So I'm going to look for this so that way we can see it change. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add something to the end of the field. That way we can see the change to it. This was added to. All right, so now we can see it. We check use regular expression. We go ahead and tell it to replace all. Five modifications were made, and those are the five modifications here. You can see it's added to the end, where this conditionals option, which did a look for 041 um, subfield H, and then made the change based on the presence of that data. We can have it look for the not presence. So if I say not at the beginning, then it will do an edit against anything that doesn't have an 041 with a subfield H in it. So I can have a different kind of conditional. So in this case, this was added to the end. Not. And we get a lot more modifications. And if we look, the first record wasn't changed, but the second record here has been. Here's the for not, because it did that conditional edit in order to do um, a lookup. Now, one of the things that's really cool about the replace function that's not available um, as easily in the select records for edit is you can stack conditionals. So this is fairly new to mark edit, um, but you can do things like this, not 041 and equals 245. build a so I can have the criteria do two things uh, before it does this so it can say not doesn't have an 041 and the 245 subfield a has the word new in it so I can stack multiple ones I can do and 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 then another criteria and then another criteria or and then another criteria as long as I use and and or in between the criteria that I create, and they can be either exp regular expressions or not regular expressions, I can add as many criteria as I want mark edit to evaluate for before it does this processing here. So that is a really powerful way of working with records. So inside the replace function, you'll also see a couple of other options. This multi-line evaluation, I usually discourage people from using it. Um, the reason why is it allows the way that mark edit works in general is that as you edit records, it edits line by line. These conditional functions allows mark edit to do evaluation across an entire record, but still the edit happens on a particular line. And that's to protect you so that you don't actually de delete a bunch of accidentally delete a bunch of data. If you turn on the multi line evaluation, mark edit allows you to edit across lines in which case it's really easy to delete data in your records. You're responsible now for making sure any data that's in your record that might be picked up on a regular expression has to be put back. That's no longer, uh, you're no longer protected from that. But it's a pretty cool way to be able to do, again, um, very complicated and surgical um, work within um, a record set. I'm gonna grab a different record for the next one here.
Uh, geo records. Okay, so the next one we're going to do here. Um, so uh, the tool has these edit shortcuts. Uh, like I said, these are Mark 21 style shortcuts. Some of these things are really straightforward. So let's say on vendor records, our vendor records, a lot of times we get vendor records that have uppercase. Um, here's an example. So we have a record here, it's all uppercase. Um, a lot of times we just want to be able to do a very simple way to uh, fix that. So the change case allows you to uh, change the case statements um, to different styles of casing. So in this case, we went back to uh, capital case. So it allows you to very quickly change regular, change the, uh, the case statements within a, uh, a field and a subfield. Um, So that's really straightforward. Uh, edit functions, field functions, these tend to be things that um, are, um, uh, again, uh, related to things that I run across in Mark 21. Uh, so smart characters, smart characters are the bane of um, Mark records existence. We get them if you copy and paste from things like uh, Microsoft Word. Uh, smart characters are problematic because there are three characters in smart character set that if you pull them apart at a binary level, level have an end of character marker as one of their characters um, in that binary um, decomposition. That is super problematic. So the tool here has the ability to clean smart characters and it will replace a smart character with its non-smart character equivalent. Um, you can clean ISBD punctuation. Uh, this uses the um, most aggressive form of ISBD punctuation clearing, um, which is the one I prefer, um, that's been recommended um, uh, from, that's been provided from the PCC, uh, you do have the option to update the list before processing. So it'll ask you, do you want to change it? It's just a, um, a text file uh, that has uh, essentially a lot of regular expressions in it that tells MarkEdit what it should do to the punctuation and when and when it should and shouldn't do stuff with it. Save the changes and then let MarkEdit go and do its stuff and then it cleans up the punctuation, removes a lot of characters and then um, uh, I'm happy. Uh, actually, I do that for every record set that I work with before I move it out of MARC into um, a non-MARC format because the punctuation um, tends to be really problematic for me when I'm working with non-MARC record sets. Um, in addition to um, edit fields, we have things like um, pairing um, ISBN 13 values. So if you have a record set where it just has ISBN 10, you can pair it with an ISBN 13. MarkEdit will generate that ISBN 13 value for you. Um, some uh, miscellaneous functions for like finding missing words, missing fields, duplicate tags, limit line numbers. Um, a lot of times in vendor records, um, we'll get uh, HTML entities. Uh, for some reason, they don't turn them into the characters. And so you'll end up with something like an ampersand X, a large number, and then a, a semicolon. If you run this function, MarkEdit will find those and turn them into their character equivalents. Um, and then the last one, which is why I grabbed the, um, the record set here, is you can convert data from um, decimal degrees, uh, from, from minutes, seconds to decimal degrees. And so that's actually kind of useful, um, especially if you have to work with, um, uh, sorry, that's not what I wanted, especially if you have to work with um, uh, GIS data. So I work with a, a number of GIS data sets. And so um, I'm going to find record set here. I'm pretty sure there's one record in, whoops, sorry, regular expressions. There we go. So I have one record here. Um, oh, I've already converted it. So uh, a lot of times what will end up happening inside of a GIS, inside of a data set is um, by default, mark records have what are called um, uh, degree, seconds, minutes, coordinate, degree, minutes, seconds, coordinate systems. So it'll say like West 124, um, degrees and then um, uh, minutes and seconds. Those aren't useful inside of most GIS systems. And so MarkEdit has a facility, um, this function here, mathematical function, that will convert those minutes, uh, uh, degrees, minutes, seconds into their decimal, de uh, decimal degree equivalents. So that's what you see here. Um, and then actually you could extract that data or um, convert this data into um, FGDC and actually use it in a GIS system. So um, that's kind of what these edit shortcut functions are for. They allow you to, like I said, they, they tend to be a little less focused in some respects because sometimes they're things that I, I need as a, a one-off. I consider these kind of one-off functions, but they do have some things that are actually fairly useful. All right, so let's go ahead and look at um, 
global functions. All right, so global functions. Um, I'm going to ignore these for the most part, unless people have specific questions of them. I'm going to look at the ones down at the bottom because those are the ones that tend to be um, the ones that most people use. So uh, add delete fields. Um, add delete fields work um, like they say they do. Um, you can add fields. So 999 slash slash subfield A, add this field. Um, and I can add that field globally. So without any other options, it will just add that field. So I add that field. Um, it added 168 fields. Uh, if I want to make sure that the field only gets added if it's not present, then I can check that box. Now if I add it, there should be zero. Um, so it would only add that field if there wasn't one present. If I want to only add the field if it's not a duplicate, I tell it to do that. So again, it evaluates it. These are all duplicates, so it's not going to add the field. Um, and then I have an option where I can add a field if something's not present. So in this case, let's say I wanted to add a field, um, but only if, uh, say, the, uh, the 034 wasn't present. Um, so Oh, sorry, that added it if it was present. That was not what I wanted. When you do things you don't want, there's special undo. If I wanted it, if it was not present, then I would say not in the beginning. So not present, um, add the field. So all these fields should have 034s because they're all geographic records. So the add field options here have criteria that you can also add to them to uh, decide when and where you're gonna add records. Um, likewise, the, de the uh, deletion functions, have options available to them as well. So um, if I wanted to delete a large class of data, so let's say I want to delete all 900 fields, I could say 9xx, and x stands for a wildcard. So if I, this will get everything from 900 to 999, delete those fields, lots of fields deleted. If I want to remove duplicate data, I can check the remove duplicate data option. Um, enter in the field that I want to look for, and if I leave it as a field only, it'll look for dupli the duplication has to be complete, so the fields have to be completely duplicates. If I enter in something like this, 990 subfield A, then it's going to evaluate just the subfield A for duplication and only remove the, the field if they're duplicates within the subfield A, or I could do something like um, this data, and MarkEdit will evaluate the 999 field and will look for fields that have the words this data in them and treat any fields that have, if there are multiple fields that have that in it, then it'll treat them as duplicates. And we can remove field data that does not match. This is really handy for 856s. Let's say I want to get rid of any 856 that doesn't have my proxy. I can do 856 my.proxy.edu tell it to delete the field, it'll delete any field that doesn't have my proxy information in it. So a couple of different options there. Copy fields. MarkEdit has copy field function. This allows you to move data um, from one field to another. It's more of a direct copy. Um, but the move field, the, it's more of a direct copy um, from one field to another. The one thing that I do like to highlight is what's called the move field data. This allows you to take things like right here where I have three fields, three 501 fields, Let's say I wanted to move um, all, of, I wanted to keep the first one as a 501, but I wanted to turn the rest of them into a 502. Um, I can tell it 501, destination fields a 502, move the field data, but preserve the first one. And now when I look at these records, you'll see that the first one stays as a 501, the second two move to a 502 um, as a direct copy, uh, but I preserve the data in the first one. Um, I can change that element, and if I wanted to preserve multiple ones, I could say one through two, one through three, one, five, eight. So um, you can tell it which positions you want to preserve, and it'll, it'll do that as part of the criteria. Field edits um, essentially uh, was put in place to simplify field edit functions, particularly the regular expression parts, um, because when you use the replace function, you have to include information about the field. Um, this allows you to target fields specifically. So if I wanted to make a field edit to say like an 088, program asks you what's the position number. So let's say I wanted to change uh, this data here. Let's count it out. 
position zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's going to be position seven and four, seven and four. And we're going to replace data with, uh, uh, we're going to find anything that says 2000 and we're going to replace it with data that says uh, 1999. Process that. And we can see here the modification that gets made. If the data is not a control field, so anything below um, 10, so let's say like 245, the position element goes away. Um, now I'm finding data inside of the 245. I can specify a subfield if I want, but I'm finding data inside um, the field and doing a find and replace or regular expression. Indicators at indicators. So this is the one I use the least because I can never figure out, I, I would just use a regular expression for, for indicator edits, but it targets just indicators directly. Edit subfield data allows you to edit data at the subfield level. Um, the one thing that I did want to point out because this comes up periodically, and so I'm putting it in the slides here, is right here. Uh, Mark Edit has, when you edit, when you add a new subfield, Mark Edit adds the new subfield to the end of the field. If you want to specify a position of a subfield, there is a knowledge base article specifically for that that tells you um, what the um, syntax is that you would use um, in order to specify positioning of the subfield insertion. And again, remember because Mark Edit is Mark agnostic, the positioning has to be specified um, using this format. So here's an example of how you would do uh, an older style GMD where you would place the, the data that you want it to fit in before and the information that you want it to fit in after. And so this explains that process. Um, this is one of the places where unfortunately, where if you are doing uh, your where mark edits not being mark 21 specific allows requires you to do a little bit more work in order to um, insert subfields in maybe an order that you're looking for. Uh, mark edit has the ability to add subfields when they're not present, to add subfields only, so whether they're present or not, to delete subfields or to delete duplicate data in a subfield. So lots of stuff there. Uh, swapping fields allows you to copy data from one field to another and um, basically create new fields based on subfield data from other elements, uh, copies the whole subfield data into the new fields. Um, and then finally, there's a tool in Mark Edit called um, Build New Field. This builds one new field inside of your record. Um, and I'm going to uh, actually delete really quickly so I can show you how this works. I'm going to delete the O2O field, which was one I constructed when I was playing around with these records this morning. And I'm going to use the Build New Field tool. That way you can see kind of how it works. So the Build New Field tool is built on patterns. So you create the pattern that you want to use. So we'll do the OO2 so that way you can see it show up right here. Um, and the pattern we're going to use is we're going to take data from the OO1. So we're going to capture all the data from the OO1. Then we're going to capture um, the data from the 049 subfield A. And then we're going to take the data from um, the uh, 086 subfield A. So what Mark Edit does here is I've told Mark Edit that to create this field, I want to take bits and pieces um, from other parts of the record. And I'm going to add this field only if it's not present. And I go ahead and process it and mark edit then creates an O2O here, which we can see that pulls the individual aspects of the individual field into the record. Now you may want to only pull parts of individual fields or subfields and you can do that. So um, inside of mark edits build new field function and that's why I put it here. Mark edit has the ability to use functions. So for example, here we can see a function that uses an example of a function where I'm building an 856 where the subfield A is going to find an 090 that has a G42 in it and it's going to trim that value. So it's going to take just that call number in that space. Um, here I might want to take the substring, so I want to take just a part of the LDR. Um, so you can use these functions to either replace data on the fly, trim data, use regular expression matching, um, or to actually take just small subsets of data as part of that new field pattern, build new field pattern. 
All right. Um, one of the functions I want to highlight inside of the tools window that's not down below um, is what's called the, the uh, generate call numbers tool. This is particularly useful for e-records. A lot of e-records won't have call numbers associated with them. Uh, mark edit, whoops, sorry, wrong function. Um, call numbers, generate call numbers. Mark edit uses OCLC's classify web service where it takes characteristics about the record and sends it to OCLC and OCLC sends back uh, a suggested call number based on the information. You can decide um, criteria around how you want those call numbers to be created. Part of the reason why you may want to do that is a lot of vendor records also don't include subjects. If a record includes an LCSH call number, you can make use of a new tool inside of MarkEdit um, that allows you to generate subjects on the fly. So here is a set of records. Um, I'm going to do a small set because uh, actually I'm going to use this set. I'm going to use a small set. The reason why is because the, um, the, the tool will take a little bit of time uh, to run because it's going to actually be talking to OCLC a lot. So not that one. We're going to use the other one I just opened. So this one here, there's a handful of records here. You'll see there's no subjects in them, um, but there is a call number in the record. So the 050. So mark at it if you um, have worked with OCLC and you've turned on the ILS, the, the OCLC integration in mark at it, um, you can work off of the WorldCat database. If you haven't, then you can use the, um, the mark at it will use LCSH. Um, but in this case, I do use OCLC stuff. So I do have the integration. So I'm gonna go ahead and work against um, OCLC's database. So I can select my small call number set. Um, I can tell it to generate with subjects. Um, I'll include fast headings, tell it to process. Now it goes through and what it's doing is it's taking the OCLC numbers, it's sending them to OCLC and then it's using that as a starting point and then it's going out and it's doing some linked data work to build a knowledge graph about an individual record. And once it understands enough about that record, it will create subjects. So um, here's my generate with subjects. Um, not all records will have subjects, but you'll see um, that uh, some of them do. It starts to create subjects for records um, based on the call number that was provided. So, um, so that's kind of a nice tool to play around with, especially for e-records where you may not have um, a lot of information about them. Um, that happens automatically. Uh, okay, um, so I had mentioned the last thing I want, so let me get back to Mark Edit records. Let me go back to my set. Um, okay, so let's do, let's talk about reports. Um, and then I'll see if there are any questions. So Mark Edit has specific reports. So we have things like field counts. This is a quick way for you to see what kind of fields are being used within your records. Um, if you want to see what kind of subfields are being used in a particular field, you can right click on it and tell it to count subfields. It'll show you indicators and subfield usage. You can export those um, as a report so that you can look at them all at once instead of having to look at them individually. You can do material type reports, so generate a material type. Mark edit breaks it down into multiple sections. Um, the top level is what I would consider to be kind of the characteristics of the record. Those come out of um, uh, a combination of the LDR, um, the 008, and information that it gleans from the 007. The data down below here um, is data that's definitely not pulled from, it's, it's more uh, aggregated from a variety of other sources, including GMD. And so you may end up getting um, in this section down here um, some very interesting non-standard uh, non um, uh, material types if the GMDs or information in that space um, isn't uh, standards based. Um, and so this gives you a way to be able to see that and then go look for it. Um, as I mentioned, Mark Edit has uh, a validator. So inside the Mark Editor, 
um, I can validate records and it will tell me based on this rules file if there's any information here that may not meet the rules file. In this case, there aren't for any of these records, but it does tell me that it believes there is a duplicate record based on this information, this value um, in, the, in the record set. Um, if I was to grab a different record set, let me grab a different record set so we can see this process work. Uh, I think this one will have some. Let's try to validate here. A little bit larger. So this is what the validation looks like. Um, it gives you a, a record number. Um, uh, 245 and then the type of records that it believes that it's come across. Um, if you click on this link, it'll jump you to that record inside the Mark Editor. Um, you can look at record edits, you can look at records um, errors either at record number, like record numbers here, or you can change the tool to group by record, um, errors by record number. And now when I run it, it will reassemble the report so that I see um, errors by record type. So in this case, um, the 050 uh, indicator 2 or the 060 indicator 2. So it shows me all the records that have these particular errors and it groups them together differently. Again, if I've worked on a set of records, I try to compile it back to mark. Um, from the mark editor and the program won't compile your records. You can check here and it will validate the structural data in the MRK file to see what in the MRK file isn't um, valid and preventing you from compiling the record back to mark. Um, and you can remove an invalid record the same way um, as you can do it with the binary mark data. Uh, finally, I mentioned um, log files. So log files are really handy and there's a couple of reasons for it. Um, I'm going to just quickly do a, an add field. Okay, so what happens is inside the log file now, if I view the current log file, I can see all of the changes that are made. So this is actually really nice if I'm using a task. Mark edit will flag every change that's made inside the record. Um, and it keeps track of the changes by record. Um, so that way, if for some reason something doesn't work, I can go back and review the log files and see um, what kind of fell apart. The other place where this is really, really useful is let's say you're working with a set of records, you're working with um, six million records. So I, I get asked to work with very large sets of records sometimes. Um, and maybe I'm working with them in Mark Edit or I'm helping people facilitate a process. I've worked with a large set of records. The reality is I've only edited a small subset of those records. And I don't want to have to overlay a bunch of records that didn't change. I just want to overlay the changes. Well, in Mark Edit, I can use reports, manage logs, advanced log management. Whoops, uh, sorry. I think I, sorry. I think that got, uh, I think the log got stuck. Reports, manage logs, advanced log management. And so the tool will take the log file that's there. And if I click on extract change records, the tool will only will will extract from your set just the records that have been changed. So let's put that in in context. Let's say I have 100,000 records. I've done a bunch of task edits on them. Um, the reality is of those 100,000 records, I've only changed maybe 15,000. I can use this extract change records and only extract those 15,000 and just upload those changes. So I don't have to overlay the whole 100,000 records to update those 15,000 I changed. I can just pull the changes, which is kind of useful for folks. Where it's also useful is if you run into issues, you can use this tool that says help, package files for debugging, and Mark Edit will pull together all of the log files that have been created, as well as all the temp files that were created as part of your session, and put them in a zip file so you can send that to me. 
And then I can actually walk through all the steps that you've taken and be able to see what might have happened and why there might be a problem. For really, really hard to debug problems, that's probably the best that I will ask people to do that because that's the best way for me to figure out what in the world's going on. Um, and finally, uh, one function that's fairly new to Mark Edit that I, I do want to point out because I, I forgot to um, when I was talking during the first session is what's called recover previous versions. So one of the things that I hadn't realized um, because I learn new things all the time is how people do market, how they do Mark Edit workflows. Um, so I'm going to grab a, a small file here and I'm going to show you what I mean. So here's a small file. Um, a lot of people will do mark edit workflows like this. They'll, you know, do a change. They'll add the, the record. And then they will save that change. And then they will, they delete a record, delete, delete some data. And then they'll save the change. And then maybe they'll add another. And then save the change. All right, so let's say at any point during this process, either a mistake was made, so you re and you can't, you made a mistake somewhere and the special undo, maybe it was like two steps back and the special undo is not gonna fix that because it only undo undoes the last global edit. Or maybe um, you've made some changes and have introduced into Mark Edit a formatting error, and that formatting errors caused the program to have some difficulty rereading your file. You can go to Files, um, Recent, and Recover Previous Versions, and Mark Edit keeps a copy of each item in your session that was saved. And so I can roll Mark Edit back to any of the versions that had been saved um, that I had been working on um, and take that back to the previous instance. So that way, say I made a mistake and I didn't realize it until I saved it three times, I could roll it back to the, the version before that mistake was introduced and not have to lose all of my work. All right. And when I close Mark Edit, the session ends, it clears up the session data that was there. All right, so let me take a look and see, did we cover everything that I had here? Blah, blah, blah. So sorting fields, reports, validating. Okay, I think that's all of it. So those are the slides that I had. Um, again, like I said, this was related to um, questions specifically people have been having as they've been starting up working with Mark Edit. Um, sometimes the first time, sometimes um, outside of their environment for a while. Um, and so I wanted to go ahead and start with there. All right, so if you have questions, let's see here. Um, uh, yeah, I can deal with that one later. So yeah. Um, can I have a recorder there? Oh, okay. Yeah, I can deal with, I can do that. Uh, we have recorded it. Okay, got a dash. So I'll go ahead and hang out for a second. So if you have any particular questions, um, go ahead and put them into the chat. Um, and if not, then I will in the session, we'll get it pushed up onto the, uh, onto the um, uh, YouTube channel for other people to be able to see this. Um, so I'll, I'll give everybody a couple minutes. All right, let's see here. Do, do, do. Okay. Uh, okay. So it looks like, uh, let's see, find or replace. If you only have one condition, does it have to be in parentheses? So that's a good question. So, so no, in the fi find and replace function, um, the reason why I was using parentheses is because I was using um, regular expressions. So inside of the, uh, inside of the conditional um, it, when you're doing find and replace, um, if I was doing a search that didn't have to be a regular expression, so let's say I just was searching for data, I would change that option to has, and I could say like not equals 034. Um, and then I'm no longer doing the parentheses. The parentheses are really a, a part of the regular expression language. 
um, to allow me to be able to do um, very precise um, kind of, of edits. So that's what that's for. Uh, let's see, uh, what was the next question? Um, uh, if you update uh, mark edit, you won't have to redo the task, will you? No, if you update mark edit, mark edit doesn't delete your tasks. Um, it preserves them. Um, and if for some reason you did find that your tasks were deleted, um, you could go to um, this function here, uh, assuming it's a relatively new version of Mark Edit, uh, troubleshooting options, and you could go to um, configuration options and restore configuration data from backup. Uh, Mark Edit, um, as long as you by default uh, turns on this option right here that uh, automatically backs up your settings and part of the backup settings are your tasks. Um, so if for some reason you find that they've been uh, deleted or they've gotten munged somehow, you can actually restore from a backup. It keeps 10 days worth of backups. Uh, let's see here. Any plans to create the capability to suggest an LCS to suggest LCSH based on a call number? Um, so that was actually what I showed you how to do is how to suggest an LCSH um, um, uh, subject from a call number. If you have um, call numbers in your records, you can use this tool here called Generate LCSH, LCSH Subjects, um, and it will use that call number to generate um, uh, LCSH subject headings. Now, it's not actually doing maybe what you're asking, which is um, pulling this, the call number apart and, and suggesting a subject. What it's actually doing, because a call number really only gives you information about the most top, the most um, uh, the, it should be the primary topic. What it actually does is it takes that call number and it sends a request out, multiple requests to either WorldCat or LC, uh, Library of Congress, and it collects a corpus of data. And based on that corpus of data, it pulls the records apart. And then it asks other linked data services and it builds a knowledge graph, something about that record. And it follows particular threads until it thinks that it has enough information to suggest what it believes to be are the two or three or four um, most relevant LCSH headings or LCSH headings plus fast if that's what you've asked it to do. Um, so it's, it's not a, a one to one like take a call number and turn out an LCSH um, suggestion. Um, it's more of a process to take a call number and dig into that call number to find other res to find out what um, a record may be more about um, is kind of what that that process works like. Uh, oh, so you meant a call number based on LCSH. Um, that I haven't done, um, and I'm not quite sure yet um, uh, if I'll end up doing that. It, some of it has to do with um, how easy it is to reverse the, uh, the, the graphing process that I use now. Uh, let's see here. Reload local 978. Uh, load data fields when adding records to ILS. Is there a way for MarkEdit to generate a date into a field somehow um, based on a file? Uh, I'd like to add addition, an addition of this field info to the task instead of, so you can. Um, and the way that I would actually recommend doing that, um, so there actually is a date function in MarkEdit. Um, so you can have it generate a date. The problem is I don't know if the date will output in the format that you're looking for. Um, it tends to be very specific dates for um, uh, a very, spe very specific in terms of ISO date formats uh, supported. However, inside of a task, and if you watch the first set of webinars that I put together, um, I showed this, you can have tasks um, ask for user data. So this function here, I'll show you what this looks like. Um, this is an add field function. And this bit right here that says input box, enter catalog or name here and in the parentheses, that's a special mnemonic format that MarkEdit uses that allows you inside of a task to ask for users to enter data. So that way inside of a task, if you have information that needs to change every time, you can actually use the task and embed this kind of input box request and have the user enter that information in 
and then it gets reused inside of the task. So if you have information like that that needs to change on a regular basis, this gives you the facility to be able to do that. Um, that's probably the way that I would go about doing that. There is a, a function in MarkEdit, it's called, I'd have to look and see, I don't want to write it down because I'm not going to, I probably won't get it right. I, I can, I can, if you ask, if you send me a note, I can send you exactly what it is. There's a, it's like ME date, and then you can provide um, a date format that you want to, to output the date as. But again, like I said, the dates tend to be very specific because it makes use of, um, uh, the .NET date, date library, and so they tend to be uh, more ISO specific, and this right here doesn't follow that convention. So I would probably use the one that allowed for input. Uh, all right, any other particular questions that we have here? Um, All right, so I'm going to talk for a minute and then I'm going to close it up. So um, we're going to do this again next week. Uh, next week, uh, assuming I don't get um, uh, other questions that come to me, because I am asking folks, if you have suggestions, let me know. Um, I will probably look at um, non-MARC data because I like to, I think that that's a, a fun topic. We'll look at processing EAD data. We'll look at processing non-MARC data, harvesting via OAI. Um, those kind of things. Um, so unless I get a different suggestion, uh, that will be the topic that I will shoot for uh, next time. Again, I'll be putting this recording up into um, the uh, YouTube channel. And like last time, I will include the, um, the transcript, which gets generated automatically from um, the uh, the Zoom instance here that's being created. So that way that should be there. And I'll also either include in the comments section of the YouTube section, um, a link to these slides um, or figure out a way to make sure that they're available for folks so they can use them. Um, so that's kind of my plan. Uh, so hopefully that works for everybody. And again, like I've done the last two weeks, I will do two sessions. One that will be primarily geared towards folks who are over on um, the Australia, New Zealand side of the world, um, and then one that will be more geared this side for folks of us in North America and probably early UK um, um, European folks, depending on if they're interested. So uh, hopefully this has been useful. If you have questions that, uh, or I've confused you, listservs there, feel free to email me. Um, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and stop and I hopefully will see some of you all again next week. So I will stop recording.